Okay, so this is my first case. Uh, we can see that there's a consolidation at the lung base here and some fluid. So this was just a really nice, cute example of something. I'm taking volunteers. Just drop gallstones that got entrapped. Yeah, yeah. So this is a really nice example. So radio dense stones here along the right, you know, border of the liver, um, causing this chronic abscess with this thick wall. And it actually communicated through the fenestrations of the diaphragm so that we also have part of the abscess going into the lung base. So just a cute example of dropped gallstones. They ended up putting a drain into this guy and also into the lung um, and the, the abscesses are doing better. I'm gonna pause for a sec. Okay, so this is another patient. You can see that they've got some processes in their psoas muscles. And in the back, and in the leg here. So multiple fluid collections. And then I'm going to show you their bones. Um, are they from an endemic country? They are from the United States but they are from a part of the United States. That is a clue. I don't know, with the big psoas abscesses, I was thinking TB. Okay, good thought. They also have all these lytic lesions. Or some kind of granulomatous infection. Good thought. It is an infection. Lytic okay. lesions. And then I'm gonna actually show you the, um, let me show you their lungs. Um, so does anyone know that, and they were, um, they were living in Arizona for a while. Histoblastome. Coccidium. Coccidium. Yes, good, 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 good. So this was actually florid coccidiomycosis. So I just have a few teaching points about coccidio. It is um, usually found in the soil and the dust um, in California and Arizona. Arizona is the big state where it's pretty endemic. Uh, many people have coccidio infection. Um, it's usually only pulmonary. It's rare for it to be extra pulmonary. Um, but in, in this case, um, they had florid extra pulmonary disease, a um, lot of lytic lesions in their bones that had kind of grown out of the bone and were now causing chronic abscesses in the psoas and also the, um, the left hip here. Um, it is uh, more predominant in male patients. And um, usually it doesn't cause severe disease unless you're immunocompromised. So the big risk factors are HIV, as well as um, patients who have undergone organ transplant, um, diabetes. And then there's two populations, um, African-Americans and Filipinos that actually have a higher risk of getting more severe disease. So this was just a rare case of extra pulmonary coccidio in a patient who was exposed actually during a dust storm in Arizona and now has this disseminated um, fungal infection. So coccidio is a fungal infection, um, usually just sticks in the lungs, but can get to your bones, um, joints, uh, muscles, et cetera. So the treatment is fluconazole. Um, usually they're treated with oral fluconazole, um, but in this case, um, this has been refractory to even oral fluconazole. So pretty cool case. We don't usually see it in Atlanta. Hey, Omar, I see you've joined. Okay, so this is my next case. Um, and this one, basically this patient has, um, this is their CBD and then they have um, like sort of a strange appearance of their gallbladder. And I kind of wanted to see what you guys thought about it. One of my colleagues was asking me if I thought there were two gallbladders because there seemed to be like one lumen here and another lumen here. It looks like it's folded on itself though. 
Yeah, exactly. And I'll show you, let's see. Um, this was the one where they sort of were like, it looked like two, two different things. Like, is there a cyst next to the gallbladder or is that the gallbladder? But basically what we realized was that um, it's just folded on itself and there's actually um, what we call an hourglass gallbladder. So for example, right here, we have this ring where it's kind of cinched down. And this is actually the fundus of the gallbladder that has a thicker wall. So this is what we call an hourglass gallbladder. And this little area here is a ring of adenomyomatosis um, that you can get like cinching the middle of the gallbladder. And that usually leads to sort of chronic cholecystitis and adenomyomatosis of the fundus with a, like a more proximal uh, normal gallbladder. So you didn't fall for it. This was just an hourglass gallbladder with a ring of adenomyomatosis. Okay. Okay, so this was a cute case. Um, this patient had this lesion here, this dumbbell shaped lesion um, that was kind of endo exophytic arising from their duodenum. So what do you guys think about that lesion? What would be your differential? Um, they also have a history of, um, of melanoma. I'll show you the lesion again. What do you guys think about this? Almost looks like it has a stalk, I think. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? Some kind of polyp. It's not, it's not as enhancing as the adjacent vessels, which, I mean, makes me think of things like neuroendocrine tumors, which would enhance more, I think. This almost looks like there is a stock to it. So I would wonder if, if it's some sort of a polyp. Okay, good. Um, and this is the arterial phase. What are you thinking now as far as, is it enhancing enough for you to say neuroendocrine or you want no, it to be Unless brighter? it's centrally necrotic. <laughs> okay. So anyway, we said it looked kind of endo exophytic. One possibility might be a gist because they like to be both endo and exophytic dumbbell shaped kind of like this. Um, we also brought up neuroendocrine tumor and we said it could be a melanoma metastasis since they had a history of melanoma. Um, and then on this scan, there was also this new lesion here in the liver. So because it was new, we were very suspicious about it. So we said, well, this could be a met either from melanoma or from that duodenal thing. Um, so we recommended an MRI. In the process, the duodenal thing ended up getting biopsied and was a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. So this guy was a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. They, they you know, are not that uncommon in the duodenum. That's a place they like to go. When they met, they often go to a local lymph node um, or to the, uh, to the liver. Since it's well-differentiated, that's a better prognosis, less likely to metastasize. So um, then we were investigating that liver lesion this is the pre-contrast. Arterial. Oh, really? What is a met then? Arterial phase. Venous phase. Mm. And a met from what? Melanoma, but then I want to see the subtractions too. Yeah, okay. So there it is on the subtractions. Not a ton of enhancement, but there was enhancement we thought in it. And it was definitely new. And um, like you said, the key here, let me show you another subtraction. Oh, this one's not great. But the key here is also that on the pre-contrast, it's super bright. So um, that is really good for, uh, for melanoma. So even though we now have two primaries, melanoma and a neuroendocrine, and um, this thing looks pretty bright on the arterial phase, on the pre-contrast, we can see that it's super bright. So um, that's gonna be much more for melanoma. Nice pick up on the CT. Yeah, yeah. So always narrow your windows on those CTs um, so that you can see these more subtle lesions. And actually going back to that CT on the arterial phase, let's see, because we always think about melanoma mets being, you know, hypervascular, but you know, in this case, it wasn't very hypervascular. 
um, probably because it had so much melanin in it and that's why it was so T1 bright. And actually this arterial phase, well, it's a decent one because there's mixing in the portal vein, but um, mostly we could see that it was hypo enhancing on this um, portal venous phase. Okay, that's it for me. Um, anybody else have any other cases? I have one more, let me stop recording. Uh, so this was when I was in uh, San Diego and uh, this was a um, middle-aged Filipino ma uh, male who came in um, just with a lot of nodular and thickened appearance of the omentum with a large volume of intra-abdominal ascites. And this actually the acidic fluid uh, grew coxy. Um, so just, just uh, talking about the extra pulmonary manifestations as going off of uh, what uh, RTU said, um, just it may mimic uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis or pseudomyxoma peritonei, and the liver and spleen may also be involved with uh, hepatosplenomegaly or low density parenchymal lesions. And I've seen a couple, uh, quite a few cases of this uh, mimicking, I haven't seen it up north in uh, the Bay Area, but more in uh, my Southern California area. And then, uh, Archie, let me switch. I have some other, two other uh, cases with uh, giving away show and tell on thrombus. Let me just uh, switch screens because that's on my desktop. Cool. When I was reading about Coxie, I was a little like, like freaked out. Like, how do you prevent yourself from getting it? And they basically said like everybody in the Southwest kind of gets it but most people don't get really sick unless you're immunocompromised and to stay away from like, if you have those risk factors to stay away from like really dusty areas, dust storms, um, those kind of things. Actually, you know what? I actually have another uh, here. I'll share my screen again. This was kind of, uh, this was a, uh, another case. It came in, I think like a week later and this guy had polycytemia polycytemia vera, and he had markedly enlarged adrenal glands. And um, I think he had cryptococcus in his CNS and adrenal medley, but this was because uh, the adrenal biopsy actually showed histo infection. And uh, let's see. So that was pretty cool. That came in right after that. Uh, yeah, histo is more common in the like Ohio, like that area, right? I think so. Yeah. Whereas yeah. the Coxy was more like Arizona and like Southwest kind of thing. Uh, let's stop sharing. And then Very I had. Cool. I remember. I remember Nellie telling me that um, the chest conference. I guess like they the 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 Mayo Arizona people are always showing like Coxy in their chest conference. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. So she sees it now at the lung bases a lot, but I had actually <laughs> never seen a case here. So. Oh, Coxy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like there's like every oh, other. Oh Nelly, you missed my case. I had this florid case of coxie. You'll have to watch the video later. Oh, is that right? Okay, we'll do. Yeah, it was in the abdomen, and then Lindsay just showed a companion. Uh, okay, let me just try to pull this up. Uh, this oh. Did, uh, so this was an individual who came in. You can see that um, she's pregnant. She came in with abdominal pain. Her history was that. Um, she did have a, a factor five Leiden mutation and she was kind of intermittently taking her Eliquis, um, but there was a, a large clot in her um, portosplenic confluence extending into her SMB. And you can see on the left upper quadrant that her bowel is just extremely edematous and hypo enhancement. Um, I like to use the tricks if it is fairly subtle of, um, I, I put MIPS sometimes on these and just see if, uh, that hypo enhancement kind of pops out, but unfortunately, um, the the pregnancy was terminated. Unfortunately, and she had over a hundred centimeters of dead bowel. Um, um, Lindsay, yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is. I'm sorry, I'm giving away the the answer already. Uh, but this is another case of just extensive mesenteric uh, venous thrombosis, and this was a lady, no cancer history. Oh, actually, no, she did have a cancer history. I'm sorry. Um, but she had just recently, within the last couple of weeks, had a appendectomy, a laparoscopic ap appendectomy coming in a couple of weeks later uh, with some abdominal pain. And uh, my, my astute resident was uh, just looking at the outpatients and making sure, just checking them before, before they left. And she had an extensive uh, clot 
in her main portal vein extending all the way down to her SMV and the portal splenic confluence. And uh, again, just another, uh, just showing the clot again. And we, we looked into it a little bit more and some of the hypotheses mainly done in animal studies, um, but that increased intra-abdominal pressure can cause also potentially a decrease in the mesenteric and portal venous flow. Um, maybe some insufflation of the carbon dioxide leads to hypercapnia, and that's implicated in decreased splenic flow and potentially mesenteric uh, vasoconstriction. Lindsay, um, wait, wait. In this patient, why did she, you, you think she had, like, what is this increased intra-abdominal pressure from? Like, is that like, you mean like a trauma situation or? Oh, uh, no, from the, the, from the laparoscopic, just from like the insufflation when they um, do the carbon dioxide, when they, uh, Oh, I missed the part. So she had, she had laparoscopic surgery for something. Yeah. I'm um, so sorry. sorry. Yeah. No, the, that she had had an appendectomy with laparoscopic surgery just got a couple it, of it. weeks prior. Um, so these were kind of some of the hypotheses that following uh, laparoscopic surgery, um, portomesenteric venous thrombus can be found. And these are kind of just the hypothesis that, um, that the increase in intra-abdominal pressure can cause a decrease in that portal venous flow or the carbon dioxide uh, can be uh, cause the decreased splenic blood flow or mesenteric vasoconstriction, or maybe during the surgery, um, prolonged reverse Trendelenburg can um, exacerbate the portal venous stasis. The last one is just intraoperative surgical manipulation can damage splenic endothelium, causing local thrombus that kind of propagates. So. I just thought that was interesting, especially we have a lot of patients who come in um, post-surgical, post-appendectomy, post-polycystectomy, and potentially just uh, looking for clot a little bit more vigilantly. Yeah, interesting. Um, in her case, do you know if they did like a mechanical and pharmacologic thrombectomy? Because it seems like it would look pretty acute. Yeah, I'll have to follow up on that. I lost the MRN, so I, 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 I lost it a little bit, but uh, no, I'll have to look into it. Interesting, thanks. Thank you.